I think that as a friend, mm -hmm. an associate, or someone that is a someone that is just present with someone else, mm -hmm. it's really taking the time out of you know out of our lives to truly be empathetic and learn about what's really going on with that person. Gotcha. And the other part. Welcome to the Tea On, where we sip tea and we talk about things. <laughs> I'm Jasmine Kyleen, and I'm here with Giancarlo Simpson, which I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, honestly. <laughs> you gave me a lot to work with before. <laughs> um, what's up, everybody? My name is Giancarlo. Uh, man, uh, Jamaican, <laughs> proud Jamaican. Um, I'm a therapist, I'm also an educator. Uh, I teach at Lynn University, a uh, big advocate for like, you know, equal rights for everybody. Um, Love promoting mental health in any way possible, man. Yeah. That's, that's really my thing. Absolutely, dope. And I feel like you don't find a lot of millennial therapists, or just, I don't know, millennials working in the mental health, well, more and more now. But I think oftentimes when people my age are looking for therapists and stuff, you're kind of seeing an older crowd, a, a, less, a more Caucasian crowd too. Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought you were the perfect face to put for <laughs> this conversation that I really wanted to have um, starting off this new season of the Tea On uh, because I think mental health is super important to talk about. I think there's a weird stigma around especially therapy yeah. uh, that we should break. So before we get into the conversation, I love a good statistic. So <laughs> I have a couple statistics that I'm going to talk about. Um, and the first would be that between increased gun violence, a strained political climate, obviously, social media, sexual harassment, school debt being a major concern, Gen Z is actually statistically the loneliest generation and the generation that is most likely to suffer from anxiety and depression, which is um, pretty awful. <laughs> <laughs> and 91% of Gen Z people of the generation said they have experienced a physical or emotional symptom due to stress and mental illness, 91%, and uh, in the past year. But millennials and Gen Z are actively changing the narrative around therapy. So we're the most likely the generations to actually seek going to therapy, yeah. which is beautiful. Yeah, we're like, we're suffering the most, <laughs> but we're like also the ones who are willing to do something about it. Right. Um, so do you have anything to say on that before I give the question? Well, no, nah, I mean, I think it's great that, that we are taking that personal initiative to, yeah. uh, to like seek personal help. I think a lot of times when you think about like mental health itself, it's like this, the biggest misconception is that you have to have like some really serious issues to mm -hmm. seek help. And I, I never promoted it like that. And I'm actually not sure where that that narrative kind of came from. Absolutely. I think it. I think it got pushed through the media. Yeah. It got pushed through uh, the movies that you see when people are in psych wards and all this yeah. other stuff. But it's really not the case. So I think a lot of people are now normalizing the idea of what healing looks like. I wouldn't even yeah. use a term like mental health per se. I just right. think it's like a healing process, and we just accompany you through that journey. Absolutely. That's so. One of the questions that I have is what you think is the biggest misconception with therapy, and what I was going to contribute to that was that I think people think you have to be crazy whatever that even means, to seek any sort of like right. therapeutic or counseling session, and it's no. Not at all, man. I think, it, like, think about it like this, like if you get an oil change, uh -huh. right? And if, well, if you don't get an oil change, over time your car's gonna break down, all this yeah. stuff, right? People actively maintain their car mm -hmm. to make sure that nothing else like falls through the cracks and nothing, no serious issue happens in the long run. Yeah. I look at mental health as the same thing. Like you don't have to really come in or wait till your car breaks down to get service. Mm -hmm. You just gotta make sure you have upkeep. So exactly. sometimes therapy can look like what I call maintenance. Mm -hmm. You come in maybe once a month or if, depending on you and your report with your therapist and just check in to see how things are going. You guys yeah. process something if you need kind of a unbiased person to kind of bounce back or get some feedback from mm -hmm. in a therapeutic setting because that setting is pretty safe and comfortable for you then so be it it doesn't have to be like i'm going through this immense stress it's like hey i want to go over something that i feel like needs to be addressed and i need to hear from someone else or I need to be able to process it with someone else exactly so. yeah love a good metaphor <laughs> um absolutely so first question would be why do you think there's a stigma around therapy in our generation because while we are actively breaking it there is I think so. I, I know you mentioned earlier movies. You think that's one of the reasons? Why yeah, I think the media plays a huge part in, in creating a yeah. norm, and a lot of things are supported by that, by the things that we do and how we talk about mental health. Yeah. So, uh, one of the historically speaking, like when you think about therapists, you think about old white men, mm -hmm. and then you also have to align like there's a lot of old white ideology that comes with it, like very 
uh, Eurocentric, doesn't really incorporate the, the different cultures and dynamics of, of people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not welcoming to people that don't look like a white person or right. old white guy or, or aligns with that type of, that, 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 um, that type of thinking. So right. that's why we have classes that promote like cultural competency. You know what I mean? Like, the, <laughs> and I remember I was in a class like that, and I was like, I don't know why we need this. And as I was going through the class, I was like, Holy crap! Now I really know why we need we, this. Like super, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah. the the reason why there might be a little bit of a misconception is that some people don't also feel like therapy is for them. Right. Like they feel like there's other ways to receive mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. uh, my friends can do it. Mm -hmm. You know that type of thing. When in reality, they they're not they're not trained to right. be a therapist. Right. Right. One hundred percent. And I think it's a way right now. There's a, a, a connect and a disconnect in educating people what therapy really really looks like, right. um, and connecting people to realize that like your friends can serve you in one way, for mm -hmm. example. However, a therapist can professionally serve you in a way that they can't. Exactly. Yeah. I have one of the questions written down. That's so crazy. <laughs> is that oftentimes when because I go to therapy once a week, and when I talk about it with my friends, I have some friends who are reluctant to do it because. They feel as though, you know, why would I tell a stranger my issues? I can just talk to my friends, I can talk to my boyfriend, I can talk to my family, it's like... But why would you tell your... But see, here's the thing, like, mm -hmm. I would love to say you can trust your friends as unbiased as possible, but your friends are also bringing in a lot of different, a lot of personal issues too, right. that they may not be... Uh, they may not know how to, to sit aside to focus solely on you. Exactly. And that's the exactly. catch me too with this. Like, yeah, I might have a friend that I could ride or die with, they know all my deep, dark secrets, but how much of that... How much of it are we actually processing together and working through? 100%. So you have right. 100%. So you have friends that know your secrets, but how many of them are holding you accountable? How many of them are yeah. helping you work on this process of growing and and like really addressing the issues mm -hmm. to stop you from doing these habits? Totally, yeah. So like that's the that's the part that's missing when it comes to mm -hmm. relationships with friends. And it also can be unfair to sort of right put the weight of your issues and your stability on a friend who isn't trained or you know what I'm saying. And of course it's okay to vent and to connect mm -hmm. with your friends, but. And also just that, just, you know, they have their lives too. Right. And I'm sure that they're trying to seek someone to have that type of, uh, to be able to vent to as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, exactly. when you think about friendships and relationships, yeah. there's, there's this reciprocity, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have those friends that just only talk to you when it's something going on with them. Yeah. And I don't really know if it's friendships <laughs> or not, but that's just your relationship with that person. Yeah. Where at, and that could be very draining in itself. Very Whereas draining. for a Absolutely. therapist, you can come in and do that. And there is no... I mean, you know, therapists go through their own processes, but course, you're not experiencing course. this drain um, right. when you're talking to me about it. Like, I'm not feeling exhausted hearing you come no. in weekly about the issues. But what I can say could be exhausting is the fact that you're coming in day and, you know, weekly with the same thing. So totally. I'd like to work with you to explore what, what we can do to change Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And that's a really cool point that you bring up, because I do want to know what uh, a mental health upkeep for you looks like as a therapist, because mm -hmm. you do have that element. Like, I just, being an empathic, I, I take on a lot, and I yeah. have my own ways of releasing it. So being someone who works with clients a lot, do you have, like, a, a ritual you go about kind of releasing what you're taking on? Ooh, ritual. Yeah, girl. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a ritual, but I can say um, there are therapists uh, that have different levels of what we call differentiation, where like, mm -hmm. like they don't get so connected or emotionally attached to something where right. it kind of seeps into their own personal life. Right. And I think just because of my upbringing and how I was raised and just the things I've dealt with, I've been I've learned to kind of disconnect and mm -hmm. connect connect in certain moments, but also disconnect. Um, in other moments. So for me, I'm fully in tuned with the client um, in that moment with them. You know, if it's really emotional and it's impactful, yeah. you know, I'm empathetic and I, you know, I show emotion just like, you know, any human being would. However, I do the best I can to leave that at the door, like leave any yeah. of my biases at the door and when yeah. I'm in the room and then <laughs> when I leave the room, you know, I take up my own experiences and walk out of there. Totally. Um, so that's why I think for, for me, I can always come into the room with, Annette, with uh, uh, preparedness of like what to expect with the client but not necessarily bringing in my own stuff got you got you that makes total sense right do you have like oh go ahead no i was gonna say i was gonna say but and i say this for every mental health professional uh -huh. if you do bring in something in that room um mm -hmm. uh, it can be helpful therapeutically it's yeah. it's, it's it could be very strategic in how you do it mm -hmm. if you feel discomfort in something that the client is saying it's okay for you to reflect on that and let them know that yeah and process totally. with them about that yeah or if it's a pro if it's appropriate if not then obviously you need to go home and talk to your supervisor whoever to kind of discuss that that discomfort and where yeah, it's coming from totally 
And it's, I think that's also a good tool that anybody could use, like just in day to day, knowing what to take on, what's yours and what's not. And yeah. Just, and being aware of that. Because I think a lot of times people are carrying weight that isn't theirs and they don't know it. Right. Um, oh, so yeah. <laughs> I would say one thing I was told to do, which I might, I need to start doing. Yeah. Uh, is probably pray before I go into the room. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Setting intention about it. And yeah, and not even just that, just yeah. kind of like for me, prayer is very important. I'm also getting trying to get into a space of being consistent with that as well. Right. Um, and you never know the, you know the type of energy that even though you feel like you've, even though you feel like you're leaving the room you know, clean, who, who knows the type of energy and burdens that may be coming along and following 100%. you along the way. So it's, it's just another way of, right, just another way to give, me, give myself some extra protection, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So I'm saying it right now, putting out there, like I need to be, <laughs> I, need to, I need to do that before I walk into the room for my sake. Hold yourself accountable for it. Oh, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. We all have our special ones. Like I, I, I pray all the time, even before I do interviews, I kind of like, I have like my, I vision my white light around me and yeah. stuff. I'll wear like um, tiger's eye stones, which are very healing and um, protective. So yeah. Do you have any like um, little like small habits or things that you do that kind of upkeep your mental health? Like, are you a meditator? Do you go on walks? Oh uh, man, mm. I'm do working on, to? I'm working on <laughs> meditating right now. I can yeah. definitely say that. Okay. Um, my upkeep, I like sitting, sitting in silence. Yeah. And Either just reflecting on, just reflecting, just kind of just processing, like either my experience or what I've learned from that session with the clients, because your clients teach you a lot. Right. Like you learn a lot. And, right. um, you know, you kind of reflect on that for yourself too. Yeah. Like I take in a lot of the things that people do and I, I add it to like what I consider like my own personal wisdom. So I, I like to sit in silence and kind of process like what I've learned from these individuals in these in these moments or and how it relates to like life or how it relates to the bigger picture right. or just start thinking about just other things that I feel like are very important that I need to address. Uh, so what is an issue you maybe have dealt with earlier in your life before you were aware of this that you think would have much better been handled through counseling or through like any sort of therapeutic practice? Oh, very good question. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say uh, this like self martyrism. Ooh. And like feeling like I deserve like these all everything that goes wrong like I deserve it because I can handle it and like you know that type of like mindset and make you stronger. right and not even and even just not even just part of making me stronger just yeah. like I deserve it you know what I mean mm -hmm. and what I feel like it, it would do it it definitely reinforced like negative thinking of myself yeah. so how it looked on like a social level would be like I would uh, like sacrifice my boundaries with people uh, for the idea of like not even just being liked, but feeling like I'm of service to them. Right, um, right. And like in the process of me doing that, I also now create a new problem, uh, which then I feel bad about. And then I feel like, you know, I have to take ownership and deserve the punishment or whatever thing that happens. Right. And we just start to cycle over again with I, where I seek for this type of redemption again. Right. And then in that process of seeking this redemption, you know, unfortunately lose sight of what I'm doing on the back end or for myself personally and right. just kept going. Vicious and it was, cycle. right, and it was this fear of like being the bad guy mm -hmm. to somebody. And then mm -hmm. I remember I realized like, I, no joke, I, uh, like last year, I was like, I was like, all right, so uh, Jesus, Jesus was the, the bad guy in somebody's story. And this mm -hmm. guy, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not walking on water. Yeah. So, you know, if you have someone that clearly has done the, the, the best that he can to exemplify what it is to be a good person and, and people still see them as a bad individual, who am I to say that I can do the same feat and, be, and have more success, right? So, you know, I just had to own the fact that I'm going to be the bad guy in somebody's story. Mm -hmm. um, and when I said that, it sucked, mm -hmm. but I also had to, it was also freeing at the same Very time. Very healing and freeing. I was you know what I mean? A so, weight off your shoulders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, definitely. Um, I'm trying to think of what mine would be. There's so many. <laughs> I, 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 was a, I was a huge people pleaser growing up, and I think, I don't know, sort of getting to the root of that would have been really nice to do yeah. in like a counseling manner. Also just, like I was bullied in sixth grade, and I like I harbored a lot of that. Right. And I don't know, I think kids could so greatly benefit from just something regular, a routine, sit down with somebody and like, yeah. Oh, for sure. And I think it, it comes down to, again, educating people on what therapy really is because yeah. especially with families and the mm -hmm. families that I deal with, 
uh, they usually love to put their kids on me, mm -hmm. you know, and be like, <laughs> fix, fix my, yeah, yeah, like, fix my kid. Yeah. And that whole, like, process in itself is so counterproductive to me right. because what you're doing is making the kid feel like they're the only problem. Right. And they look at therapy as punishment. So right. they're not going to be enthused right. to come in to work on an issue they don't think exists. They right. just see that you have a problem with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. For them, they're just doing them. Mm -hmm. And now they have to sit in a room with you for like 50 minutes an hour, like going over something they don't really care to talk to you about. Like, yeah. you know, so uh, it, that's a Ooh, big, oof. that's a big thing that I think parents need to, families need to work on is how to normalize the idea of coming into therapy. And one yeah. way that it can be done is uh -huh. if we do it together. Mm -hmm. So I, nor I, almost always hmm. prefer not to see a kid by themselves. Got you. Uh, even though I do like therapy with kids and young adults, right. do, I, I personally don't uh, think it's always gonna be the most powerful unless the parents are, are part of the process. Would they be more honest if they were by themselves though? Or it's yeah, like, I mean, for yeah. sure. You, can, you have kids that, that are open to talk to you and if they click with you, they'll vibe and they'll just still say whatever the hell, hell's yeah, on their yeah. mind. Uh, that's not always the case. That's not always the yeah. case. And, you know, that point is being strategic and knowing it and seeing what's going on in the room. So right. seeing that family together and trying to have an idea what that dynamic looks like, yeah. that lets me say, okay, all right, man, I think that you can go ahead and talk more about this in private with me. Mm -hmm. Let's just let your parents or whoever it is sit outside for a second. Let's talk. And they'll talk. Right. And I usually let the parents say their side of the story. And yeah. I just look at the kids' facial reaction to the yeah. story. I sit them out and have them talk, and they tell me a whole different case. Ooh, child. So, <laughs> and, and that's the good part because when they tell me it, and then we revisit it, and you know, sometimes the kids will say, "Hey, look, I told them about this this issue. I never see the family again." Oh wow. Um, and I had People that. Aren't really ready to face what they're no, meaning to. When absolutely not, therapy. because when it comes to working with with young adults or children, families or parents have to realize that they're a part of the. Whatever issue they're bringing in, they're right. a part of it. Of course. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, but some yeah. people don't want to acknowledge that. Right. Ooh. But, yeah. Tea. Would you recommend, um, like, family counseling, even if there is no evident problem, per se, like, just maybe to do as upkeep? Yeah, but because, yeah. different than, like, personal upkeep. Yeah. I think there's, there's, there's just, I look at it like this, like, therapy for some people is just an opportunity to be in a space that's different from their own. Mm -hmm. And it's a space where they probably feel the most comfortable, most relaxed. Mm -hmm. Like some people prefer to come. Honestly, I have some people that do maintenance just prefer to come because, hey, look, life is busy. They've, they've worked on getting comfortable with like, you know, functioning with their, with their stress. But hey, coming in here, kind of just decompressing in a awesome. different way is just even more therapeutic for them. Therapeutic. And that's all it is, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So families can do that as well. Yeah. Um, I had a couple, I have a family, excuse me, that, that said, hey, look, it seems like the most we communicate or the, the most <laughs> effective that we communicate is in this room. Because when we're mediated at least, right. yeah. But I don't even care to really even do that either. Yeah, you just kind of like, Ask the questions and let it happen. I let it process. I talk about what I see and have them kind of kind of notice, hey, look, man, it sounds like you guys aren't even bringing in your child in the conversation about making decisions, but you're mad about them making decisions without you. And then, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so those things. And then when you reflect it back on it, they were like, yeah, and then the kids would be sitting there like, you know, and then it creates that conversation. So, yeah. you know, you do what you can as a therapist to create that, that environment and space. But again, even if they come in for maintenance, they yeah. still have to go home yeah. and do the work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That so. car ride home must be wild. <laughs> uh, so something I really want to talk about, because I think it's really um, prominent in our generation, would be social media. Yeah. I'm curious to know just your opinion on what social media has done to our mental health. Because, I mean, there's pros and cons to everything, and there's pros and cons to social media, but I think it, it may have, I think there's more, I don't know if there's more pros or cons when it comes to its effect on us and mental health, but there's definitely both, right? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I think there's an impact that social media yeah, has for us. for sure. Um, and again, social media or media as a whole does, is probably one of the more powerful ways of creating what a norm is, what's normal in society. So yeah. it's hard for us to deviate from something that everyone else sees right. because we also want to be a part of this particular like group. You know right. what I mean? Right. Um, so like the, I guess some of the pros, well, some of the cons, because that's what I'm thinking about first, mm -hmm. is the fact that it can create this uh, social pressure, this pressure that people yeah. need to do something yeah. to look a certain way, to be a certain type yeah. of person. Yeah. Um, and even though it might give you a sense of anonymity, mm -hmm. at the same time, it can also be problematic because you have trolls, you have people on social media that 
put on this mask and become a really, really vicious person. Totally. And I, know, I don't even know the science behind that either. Like, I actually don't understand. I know there's a lot of articles, there's some articles about like trolling mm -hmm. um, and what that it's means. It's taking on a whole new, right. yeah, it's a whole thing. Right, and it's like, are you doing that just to be a, a dick? Or yeah. like, are or you doing, is this, yeah. or is there more to it? You it's know what I mean? It's career now, honestly. Right, yeah. um, so that's the, you know, and obviously uh, body image is a big thing I've yeah. noticed that social media really pushes. Like people, especially women, need to look a certain way. Right. Men need to look a certain way or act a certain way right. to be accepted or to get the woman or vice versa, what have you. Um, but the positives, I think, is that there's so much like resources out there that people are now pushing to mm -hmm. educate people, and that's yeah. the thing that I yeah. love now is that beautiful resource. Right, oh, we're gosh. combating like this, uh, all these negative stigmas and norms by making people people feel more comfortable with who they are, mm -hmm. and by giving them things and resources yeah. free. <laughs> that's the most important part for free that they're able to use for themselves. Totally, and yeah. I, like I feel like people don't realize that. Um, just on the con side, that they're comparing their very real selves and their very real emotions and their very real issues to like the highlight reels of other people's lives, and it's yeah. you know damaging. But at the same time, I think even like I'm gonna put this on social media, and this is you know starting conversations, really putting a face to things that you know we can identify with is if we use it correctly. Right. It, it's you know it very be effective. But yeah. If, it's a big if. What's one small change that you think we could all make to improve our mental health tremendously, just in our day to days? In our day to days, yeah. one not thing. Everyone can afford counseling, which is nah. unfortunate. Um, <laughs> is that a whole other thing you want to get into? Because <laughs> I think it's two parts. Mm -hmm. I think that as a friend, mm -hmm. an associate, or someone that is a someone that is just present with someone else. Mm -hmm. It's really taken the time out of, you know, out of our lives to truly be empathetic and learn about what's really going on with that person. Gotcha. And the other part of that is that we also have to be trusting and open to be vulnerable with somebody at some point. I don't know who it is, even if it's with, your, with yourself. Yeah. Being vulnerable is like very, very important in anything because it, it puts you into a place of discomfort, mm -hmm. which is fine. Mm -hmm. Like, I think once you learn that discomfort is, is a means of like pushing you to do something different, mm -hmm. which might end no up- No growth can happen without ex discomfort. Exactly. Yeah. So it's that relationship, I think, that's important. I think we need to take the initiative to truly hold each other accountable in a very caring, empathetic way yeah. that allows us to explore the sense of vulnerability within ourselves to yeah. grow. Totally. And we know that we have that support from somebody. I don't know if that's a, really a thing. I think people usually be like, hey, good. hey bro, are you good? So I'd be like, I'm straight. And they'd be like, all right, cool. And they walk off because they don't want you to really talk about what's really going on. They're like, I, I did my deed for the day. Right. They don't really want to know exactly what's going on. They just want right. to be able to say that, hey, look. But what about like sitting there and just saying, hey, look, man, I noticed that you are. And then exp like, see what, tell them what you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They may or may it's not. sensitive to even small things that are underlying. Exactly. Even body language changes. You can really sell like a lot from it. So. Right. Yeah. For sure. Cool. And any um, just last things on mental health, any maybe ways that you think the media and social media and just everyone in general can normalize this kind of conversation? Uh, for those that... Um like I said before about, about mental health, man, you could use it as maintenance. It doesn't have to be something seriously wrong with you or something psychotic or whatever it is. Look at it as a way for you to have someone to help you along your journey of being happy and healing. Mm -hmm. For those that pray mm -hmm. and feel like, you know, I can just pray the pain away, faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you're not putting in the work and you're just praying, you're not doing much. Uh, and a therapist can help you along that journey as well. You can continue to pray and do those things, but you can also seek mental health and have that work together to help you get to where you need to be. Totally. Um, and I definitely want to promote that the most because yeah. I think that that's an issue that a lot of people have is like, I don't need to go here because I have God or I have my friends, where yeah. in reality, you, who's to say you can't have both? 100%. You can still have your friends that talk to you, yeah. and you can still see a therapist. You can totally. still have God or whoever you worship totally. and still have a therapist Absolutely. as well. Yeah. My yeah. spiritual practice has been a huge catalyst for my healing but it would be nothing without the actual action that I put behind it and it, and it's also I would say that it's um no path in any sort of healing is linear so you're gonna have your days where you're like I did it I'm healed right. <laughs> all my issues are gone depression who is she um, and then you know maybe two days later you wake up and you feel a bit differently so just know that it's an active thing that you need to keep up right and that you know you're not just gonna 
figure it out, but it's more so just maintaining it and doing your best. And your best is always good enough. Right. Know? And that's it. And the, you said it too, man, the different part. Like, yeah. strive to be different. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, being different in itself is something that's not the same. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? 100%. Yeah. So, find out, find out what your different looks like. Yeah. 100% fine. What works for you? Yeah. Uh, hey, thank you so much for sitting with me. <laughs> Where can people find you? Or, you know, what do you want to promote or anything like that? Um, well, I do want to promote uh, once a month. My boy John and I, we host a conversation party. Yes. Um, don't know how to kind of <laughs> to explain it, but it's a space where, you, where people kind of come in, man. Anything that they have on their mind they want to talk about, we talk about it in a circle. Uh, man, it's a great support group. It's a great it's opportunity amazing. for us to talk our stuff. Yeah. I can't cuss right now. But uh, <laughs> we talk about anything that's going on in the world, man. Anything that you want to chop it up with, debate about, or just vibe with and connect with, meet with new people. Totally. We provide that space for y'all, man. It's a super dope experience. Um, catch us out, you know, uh, on Instagram. Follow yeah. us, uh, Eclectic Conversations on Instagram. Uh, follow the Beige Warrior. That's my other half. Follow me, Hydro88WR. That's the main account. And my therapy account is the Broken Stereotype, the underscore Broken underscore Stereotype. Um, yeah. Uh, shout out to CMC Therapy. Shout out to Healing Arts Institute of South Florida. Oh, uh, man. That's really it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like the end of like a low wage track or something. I know, right? Like, Dope. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. <laughs>